Okay, hello and welcome to the Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Experience. Tonight we have a special treat. Uh, we're beginning our lecture series in conjunction with the ex exhibition Southbound, uh, which will be running through uh, August. So tonight, uh, the first lecture that we have is Bill Stieber, who is one of the participants in Southbound. Uh, Bill was born in Tennessee, and he lives to this day in Tennessee, though he did spend his early childhood in Mississippi, and his people are from Mississippi. So uh, in addition, um, Bill has uh, documented uh, the blues and blues culture, music culture in Mississippi for nearly 30 years. He's been a professional photographer for about the same amount of time. He worked at the uh, Tennessean newspaper um, after uh, college in Middle Tennessee, uh, majoring in English and communication. Uh, and so he knew from an early age that he wanted to be a documentary photographer. And so uh, he has made it his uh, quest to bring um, the blues and blues culture to um, our attention. Um, I should mention that in addition to being in Southbound, one of his photographs uh, is featured in the permanent exhibition, a uh, photograph of Poe Monkeys, I believe. So uh, please join us in welcoming uh, Bill Stieber. But before we do, I, I, I uh, turn it over to Bill, I'll just mention that some of the upcoming lectures that we have uh, next week, uh, the 17th, we'll have Maud Schuyler Clay and her husband Langdon Clay, both photographers, both participating in Southbound. Uh, the week after that, on the 25th, we'll have Euphis Ruth, uh, who, like Bill, is a wet plate collodion photographer, uh, and he will be demonstrating wet plate at the Meridian Museum of Art in the morning, and then he'll come over here and show the results uh, of that um, at the max uh, in the evening. All these lectures will the, that I've mentioned so far will be at 5.30. Um, Scott Beretta will be here much of the day on Saturday for a Mississippi road trip on August 1st. Uh, following this, Will Jack, another photographer who's documented Mississippi blues and uh, uh, particularly Poe Monkeys, uh, he's got a book on Poe Monkeys, will be speaking on August 8th. Uh, that will be at 4 o'clock. And then our own Stacy Wilson uh, will be speaking on the 15th. Uh, and she'll be talking about the intersection of photography, class, and race, uh, as reflected in Southbound. And then the final uh, lecture, final lect two lectures that we have um, will be Titus Brooks Higgins, who's a North Carolina-based photographer, um, who will be speaking on the, uh, also on the intersection of photography and race. Uh, and then finally, I will give a presentation on the connections between southbound uh, contemporary documentary photographers and photographers who are working um, during the WPA era in the 1930s. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Bill Stieber. Thanks, Tony. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks out there in internet land. Um, I'm going to be showing some pictures from the mostly, almost entirely from Mississippi from the last 30 years. It's a project I call Stones in My Pathway, which is kind of borrowed from a Robert Johnson song because he's kind of a quintessential Delta, tell, Delta blues man. Um, journey started for me when I discovered my father's John Lee Hooker and Jimmy Reed records that he bought at the PX and when he was in the Air Force in the early 60s. And uh, man, that was not like any of the music that I had ever heard before. It just had, especially John Lee Hooker, there was just a music that was just connected to the earth. Um, later, Muddy Waters, uh, Howlin' Wolf, um, and then worked my way back. This is a photograph of a plowed field in Stovall, Mississippi. This is just a few feet from where Muddy Waters lived when he was discovered in 1940 by Alan Lomax. And the reason that the blues came from Mississippi is largely because of this land itself, because this land is some of the richest topsoil, the richest land in the world. Some of the topsoil is 30 feet deep uh, in parts of Mississippi. 
And so therefore, it's some of the richest land in the world. So in the system that came after slavery, the sharecropping system, um, they needed s some way to, to um, muster a massive amount of manpower to produce all the, the cotton that was needed for industry. And um, the system was not much better than slavery, but it did give some people an opportunity to make some money um, in Mississippi. And so Mississippi really was uh, kind of a metropolitan, cosmopolitan area that drew people from all around the other parts of the South because of the richness of this, of this land. And that brought new ideas, sharing, people traveled on the railroads. Um, it's not, people think of it now as this isolated, rural backwoods area, but actually it was extremely cosmopolitan. The, the musicians themselves traveled frequently to New York, Chicago, St. Louis, California, brought back new ideas, traded ideas. Uh, but it, it started for me in 1992 when I was on a, an assignment for the Tennessean to do a story on the Natchez Trace, uh, when they had just opened the entire length of the Natchez Trace. So after that story was finished, I hijacked the writer who was from Moss Point, Mississippi, and I said, I want to go back up through the Delta. I have never driven through the Delta. And if you, if you have been um, through the Mississippi Delta or through Mississippi, I'd highly recommend the way that I did it, which is to go from Natchez up. Because you get to go from the, those ghosts of, of Natchez and the cradle of the Old South up through the, the early 20th century, late 19th century South uh, of the Delta. And we stopped on the first day with uh, Son Thomas. Um, this is in August of 1992, and this is the scene that I found him. He had lit his cigarette, and the ash burned basically all the way down, and he was balancing this, this amazing cigarette. He had just gotten in from uh, the hospital not too long before he, had, he, was, he was ill, um, and I was vaguely familiar with him, but meeting him was one of the single moments that changed my life. I walked in and there was this skull that was on the, on the shelf um, in the first room there. And this is one that he made out of clay and human teeth. And he was known as much for a folk artist as he was for as a musician. He first made one of these to kind of, uh, basically to, to scare his, his father. He had set it up and he put eye sockets with aluminum foil and a candle on the inside so it kind of glowed from the back. And it sort of like it spoke to that sort of, um, you know, animistic, spiritual uh, folk religion, folk superstition of rural folks in the South, particularly African American at this time. And it had this amazing power. It scared the, the crap out of his father who was lighting a lamp and he dropped the globe and broke it when he saw it. And he, and he told son never do that again. Of course, he knew that it was, uh, he had uh, hit on something very powerful then. So he continued to make these. He was a grave digger for the rest of his life, which explains the artwork that he made. He made this. This is also the very first day I was in Mississippi working on this project. Um, this is a woman in a casket. And somebody asked him one time, he says, why do you do that, you know, make, a, make your art like this? And he says, well, the way I see it, you know, um, folks in Mississippi, it seems like the only dignity we get is sometimes in death. And so he... He depicted folks uh, in their best clothes, and that's what he was. He was a grave digger. That re reflected, you know, like, like great folk art, it reflected his life, and, and the songs that he sang were a reflection of his life. Um, and that's carried on in his son, Pat Thomas, who anybody can see any given day of the week, go to, to the uh, Highway 61 Blues Museum in Leland, Mississippi, and uh, you can meet Pat, who is at there most days. He sings and, and plays almost exactly like his father in this high falsetto, haunting, beautiful uh, blues. And he also creates this folk art. Uh, the one on the top left there is what he calls a gypsy man that's infused with a spiritual power. He, he gave one to a friend of his who brought it back and said that it was talking to him at night. So that really is, is a kind of a holdover from, from, the, from the African um, animistic, you know, um, Vudan religions, uh, where everything is, um, there's a spirituality in, um, hang on a second, in, in uh, everyday objects. Did we lose the screen here? Let's try this again. I think I have to pay more attention to it. Well, we seem to have lost the, it's working on my end. Well, anyway, I'll, um, while he gets that going, 
Well, technical difficulties live. Why you wait? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got it. Got it going there. Well, anyway, um, so I can talk a, bit, a little bit about what I'm about to. Uh, there we go. There's uh, there he is. We're back. That's that's Pat at his father's grave. Um, Pat had a um, he, he had a really really close relationship with his dad, and he um, he likes to go out there and 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 sing and play to his dad. On the on the back of the tombstone is one of uh, Son Thomas's most famous lines. It says, "Give me beefsteak when I'm hungry, whiskey when I'm dry." Um, it's the good-looking women while I'm living in heaven when I die. Um, Beefsteak blues. So this is this to show you how long ago I've been doing this. That was me with Son Thomas back in 1992. But this is the place, like I, like I said, Mississippi, the land where the blues began. This is in Parchman, Mississippi in the mid-1990s. Uh, back when they were doing the, uh, remember the around the time of the 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 1990s crime bill when we were getting tough on crime and bringing chain gangs back and stripes and all that kind of stuff. So when I finally got access, it took me about five years to talk my way into Parchman because I wanted to do a story on the Parchman band. It, it, was, it was straight out of a scene from Cool Hand Luke um, with all these guys chopping um, out in the, chopping weeds out in, out in the heat with those hose sticking to the ground. But Parchman is one of the places that it's significant in the history of the blues because um, it's one of the places where the work chant lasted the longest. And the work song, so in other words, where you're timing, you're um, chopping, timing, cutting wood, timing, uh, using a lining bar to, to align a railroad track, is all timed to these, these work song couplets. And those were kind of a basis for the blues itself. So like for instance, in a, um, on a railroad train, the reason you've got to time the work is because everybody has to hit that lining bar at the same time to inch the track over if it gets off. So the timing is super critical. So it's like, make a change and don't get lost. I know it from the country by the way you walk. Hey boy, change the line up. Hey boy, just a half. Rider, rider, hey boy, change the line up. See as we go line and track. And they would do that all day long. And after a while, there was this creativity where you would make up couplets. You would sing songs teasing the boss. Captain, captain, it must be cross. It's 12 o'clock and he won't knock off. I collected a lot of those in the late 1990s. I found the last railroad workers that were still alive that were actually did the railroad chants. And I interviewed them and I got as many of the rhyming couplets as they could remember. And I collected about 20, 25 from rural Mississippi. But another big part of the birth of the blues was uh, religious music, uh, was um, you know pre-gospel. So this is Moon Lake, um, where they still baptize. You know, at the end of every August or beginning of September, uh, big massive uh, river baptism. They've been baptizing there for about 120 years now. Uh, and one of the things you, that, that's marked by those baptisms is you'll hear them do singing styles that predate gospel music, uh, like Dr. Watts songs and lining out songs. So you, it's usually led by a strong female singer in the congregation that will line out a song and everybody else will, will repeat it with various rising and falling um, of, of, the, of the words. And it's the, one of the most powerful emotional things you could ever witness watching this baptism while the people stand on the banks and sing and the water is lapping in and the music is rising and falling, um, almost like water itself. Um, another one of the building blocks, this is Cora Fluker. She was from right here in Marion, Mississippi, right next door to, to Meridian, and she had her own little church. Um, and she was a singing, um, testifying, evangelical, witnessing, amazing preacher woman who got saved at an early age. They had, her family had to leave Alabama um, because I think her father uh, had gotten in trouble and was about to get lynched. And it was, uh, it was a dire situation. They moved to, over here to the Mississippi side. She, got, um, she went into the woods and stayed for like a day or so and prayed and, and saved herself. And she would do this thing that she called, you know, moaning, where she would testify and sing and play the guitar often and just 
two repeated rips over and over and over again. Very simple. With, again, with the um, with making up the lyrics as you go, the improvisation, which is one of the, the hallmarks of the building of the blues. Um, this is Dockery Farms, and they say that this is the place where the blues actually began. And that's fairly suspect that it actually started at Dockery Farms, but nonetheless, it's very significant because this is where Charlie Patton was from. And Charlie Patton, although wasn't the first Mississippi blues man to record, he was the most influential. Um, he didn't get to record till 1929, the same year that Blind Lemon Jefferson died. And he was really the one that started the rural, uh, uh, rural uh, pre-war blues. But Dockery Farms is where Charlie Patton was, was headquartered. That's where Pop Staples comes from. Um, Tommy Johnson, uh, another huge influence. Uh, went to see Charlie Patton there. Howlin' Wolf learned from Tommy Johnson and from Charlie Patton. So this is Dockery Farm uh, over at, between Ruleville and Cleveland is really an epicenter of the Mississippi blues. Um, this is actually the only picture in here that's not taken in Mississippi. This is actually in Elba, Alabama. This is a folk artist and musician named David Johnson. But I use it to illustrate one of the hallmarks of the blues that differentiates it from 19th century music, 19th century plantation music, uh, African American was primarily uh, banjo, fiddle, tambourine, and bones, which is the lineup for what they call minstrel, minstrel type music, plantation music. Um, by, the turn, by the turn of the century, the 20th century, Sears catalog comes out, and suddenly you have access to all these other instruments. And so, um, Banjo and fiddle gets largely replaced by guitar and harmonica, which serve a similar function. The guitar for the rhythm um, and the, the driving force of the song and the harmonica for the melodic. Also, the harmonica echoes the sounds of nature. So like with a fiddle could, could do all these barnyard sounds, could do train sounds. Harmonica was a very inexpensive, easy to play instrument that would also do a similar thing. So as the blues develops in the 1890s through the turn of the century, the music started to change with these new instruments that were coming available. Uh, and of course, of all the Mississippi-based uh, guitarists, that's the most famous, Mr. B.B. King. I made this picture in uh, the early 1990s, long before, I don't know if you, if you know where this is, that's on the railroad tracks in Indianola, Mississippi. And if you look at those buildings in the, in the back left, that is now where the Blues Museum is, the B.B. King Interpretive Center and Blues Museum. And of course, this is 20 years before that happened, uh, so there was no way we could know that at the time. But he was an incredibly generous soul to let me do this picture of him, uh, haul him out there after he had just gotten into town. Uh, and the other major instrument in the blues, of course, is the piano. Um, and that's not a portable instrument, but it, is, it was incredibly important for in levee camps, lumber camps, places where you had basically a captive audience that um, through either forced labor or employment um, did, like, when they were rebuilding the, the levees, after, especially after the 27 flood, um, in the, another one in 34, they had these le the levee camps where they, they would not let the folks leave. They would pick them up for vagrancy and un, you know, charges, hold them at the camp and force them to work. So one of the things they did to, to keep people from you know, being violent and, and, um, and revolting is that they would have these massive parties on the weekend, often with piano players, Little Brother Montgomery, Pontot Perkins, um, and this is Mose, Ta uh, uh, Mose Vincent, who, uh, who eventually worked for Sun Records. And he was one of the last of the old uh, 1930s Barrel House, Levy Camp uh, piano players that really developed that, uh, that essential style. Um, and here, is a, a photograph of Elder Roma Wilson. Now, Elder Roma Wilson was a, a harmonica player um, in, a, in a kind of a gospel style. In the, and like I said before, the, the harmonica was used um, basically as a, as a way to, to um, reflect the sounds of nature. Let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a... Yeah, here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just show a little slideshow of some of my um, harmonica player photos, and I'm going to do an old, an old song, uh, an, a version of the, of the song Shortening Bread. 
you just play a little country blues style harmonica. That's uh, Frank Frost, by the way. <laughs> Willie Foster from uh, Greenville, Mississippi. Here we go. <laughs> Round to the kitchen to kick off lead. Mama gonna cook us some shortening bread. Mama, little baby, love shortening bread. Mama, little baby, love shortening bread. <laughs> Daddy coming over. just perfect that was the last slide all right so anyway that was uh that was a little harmonica music let's see if we can get this back please work it's working ah uh, well uh, back kind of this is something that I've been kind of obsessed with I want to I want when I started out working this project almost 30 years ago my goal was to photograph almost every living blues musician, but pretty soon I realized I didn't want to limit myself to just the stereotypical, you know, old man on the porch kind of, you know, the, I was like, I wanted something deeper. I want to know what is left of the culture that gave birth to the blues, that gave birth to what is unique about Mississippi culture, about African American culture. Um, so one of the things I wanted to see is, do people still pick cotton. And so I got on the phone, called every agricultural extension agent in the Delta. Spent days and days, this is pre-internet, so I had to go to the Carnegie Library in Clarksdale and get all the Bolivar County, Quitman County, all the different county phone books. And I didn't find anybody that could help me, but somebody said they thought in Shaw there was an old couple that still farmed with mules. And I was like, okay, good enough. So I went down there, got some directions, Finally found the farm, I went in, and Mr. James and Elvie Berg had just come in from the field, and they were indeed out handpicking cotton. And so five minutes after not knowing if this existed, I was riding on the back of the pickup truck with Miss Elvie going out to the field while they were handpicking cotton in the sunset. Um, and I visited them for a number of years. Now you think, now why would anybody want to handpick cotton? Uh, because it is such brutal back-breaking work. Well, eventually I found a, a several people that still did, and every one of them, at least in their 70s. 
And that's for a couple of reasons. Number one is that that's what they had done their entire lives. That's what they knew. That's what they did. They each owned their own land. They, pick, they cut and harvested their own cotton. Both of them had cotton pickers, but they wanted to get the first round to get clean cotton because you could get a higher price for it. Now, obviously, it probably wasn't worth the effort versus, you know, just get it with a harvester. But it was also about a dignity of, of a way of life and the way that had always been raised. The way that, and this was a completely voluntary thing. And I was just so honored to, to be with uh, James and L.B. Berg um, for many years because I learned so much more than just about cotton. Because um, every time I had, I would read about some, an old superstition or a folk religion, um, any kind of folk belief that I wanted to see if it still existed, I learned that you go to Miss, Mr. James and ask him, like for instance, I read uh, an, in a newspaper article from the 1850s about a woman going out and taking an axe and putting it in the ground during a storm. And, and a newspaper man asked her why she did that. She says, well, you put the axe and it splits the storm and makes the storm go around. And I was like, I wonder if that still existed. And I talked to several people, Otha Turner and different ones that knew about that, but they didn't do it. Now, when I asked Mr. James about it, he says, oh, I still do that. He says, I put a Bible, open up uh, to Psalms in the window, go out there, take a double-bitted axe, put it in the ground, it seemed like the storm split and go around the other way. Now, um, you think, now where, why, why would that work as a, as, a, as a folk belief? Well, and you find out that much of, a lot of the, the, the traditional African-American culture uh, comes from people that were centered in Central Africa and the Congo in West Africa. And one of the... Um, the, the hallmarks of, of um, the African gods, one of them is a Shango Day, who is depicted in a cosmogram. He's the god of thunder, and his cosmogram is an axe. So I don't know if you can say there's a direct relationship between the idea of putting an axe in the ground, evoking the god of thunder from, from Africa, and splitting a storm, but, the, but it, the, the belief still has its persistence. And so I got, I waited until the day where we had an appropriate sky and I got Mr. James to, uh, to demonstrate that for me. Um, this is another a photo that's in the exhibit. This is uh, Miss Elvie. I asked him, I said, Mr. James, Miss Elvie, have y'all ever heard of putting silver dimes around your ankles in case somebody goof or dusts your path? And they both raised their legs up and showed me the dimes they had around their ankles. And I just about fell out. Um, I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. So the idea behind this is uh, it's a way of counteracting goofer dust. Now goofer dust is, um, is a, they think is a, is a uh, it's based on the word kwafa, um, which I forget which African language it's based on, but the idea is it's graveyard dirt. It's, and if you take, um, especially, it's often for ill intent. If you take the graveyard dirt from someone, especially a, a thief or a bad person, somebody you want to like, get them uh, to help you get back at your enemies. You take it like just after midnight. Remember Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil? You know, Minerva goes, you know, she was the acolyte of uh, Dr. Buzzard. Well, all of that is real. It's based on, on a kind of an African-based folk superstition. You take the graveyard dirt from near the heart, about six un inches down. You activate it with saltpeter and some other things. And then you sprinkle it either around the threshold, on the path, around the bed of somebody that you want to do harm to. And when they cross that threshold, that curse will, uh, will start working on that person and start taking them down. Now, how can you tell if somebody has dusted your path? Well, you would take a silver dime and hang it around your ankles. So if, we, if you've stepped over goofer dust, um, I guess the saltpeter or something in that would tarnish the dime. And if it turned dark, you knew that you had stepped over some goofy dust and somebody has had it in for it. Then you could go to, to a hoodoo man or a two-headed doctor and get a counter spell to counteract that. Um, it's not always that complicated. It's, it's just like, you know how a few years ago people wore the copper bracelets for because they believed that, that, well, that's modern day hoodoo. You know, in other words, it's a belief is manifested through a, through a physical object and if you believe that it works, it has a tendency to focus your energies and make the thing work, no matter what your talisman is. So silver dimes have always been long used as for good luck. Um, 
and also and for protection and in a world where you know um, we don't really have a lot of protection you know any kind of thing that will give you strength tends to make manifest that truth so that's something that is, is still been used this is a, this is actually one of my favorite beliefs that goes back in, um, to West Africa this is a bottle tree and I spent decades looking for real bottle trees uh, in Mississippi and Louisiana and different places uh, with very little luck and now, of course, every garden center from Lowe's on has bottle trees, right? Uh, and I'm glad I did the research when I did because now there's, you know, you've all seen bottle trees, right? I mean, they're everywhere now. I mean, I've got about seven in my yard, you know, but, um, but actually they, they have a really, really strong uh, background. They go back to the 8th century Congo, and there was a tradition there of blowing glass uh, bottles, and they would hang them on the huts or hang them in the trees. And what that was was to capture evil spirits. So if you think about if a, uh, an evil spirit is approaching your, your, your yard, your threshold, your home, and they see the colored light in the, in the, in the interplay of the light through the bottle, they, they want to get close to that beauty. See, it's, it's like the reason that ancient Christian churches have gargoyles on the outside. Now, why would you put symbols of evil on a holy church? Well, because evil doesn't like its own sight. It's repelled by its own ugliness. So when it sees something like that, it's repelled by it. Similar, it's drawn to the light, it's drawn to beauty. So a, an evil spirit will see the bottle, those, these are milk of magnesia bottles, which is the traditional uh, bottle tree. They enter inside the bottle and then they can't escape. Because you've seen a bee or something get inside a bottle and it can't get out. Well, that's kind of like the thought of like an evil spirit will get inside the bottle and it'll keep it from crossing your threshold. And blue is a very powerful color. Like in South Carolina, they paint all the thresholds with what they call haint blue. Blue is seen as a holy uh, subject, and uh, uh, I mean a, a color that will keep uh, evil out. Same thing with a horseshoe. There's a lot of these uh, retentions of, of uh, animistic African religion. It's still very common in the South, even though people don't know what they are. Um, you know, the tires that are buried in a yard, tires, things that encircle trees. Any kind of encircling charm is something that's designed to keep away evil spirits. Swept yards. Um, this is one that I'm particularly uh, glad to see. This is uh, James Super Chicken Johnson, great blues man from uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi. And this is at his mother's house down in Deason, Mississippi. And this is a piece of broken mirror on the side of her house. And he was playing for his cousin Frank. Uh, on the front porch while we were visiting one day and I photographed him reflected in this piece of broken mirror. And just like I said, the evil does not like its own sight. People used to put up what they call ghost mirrors on the sides of the houses. And what that does is that when an evil spirit or any kind of spirit uh, that you don't want in your uh, crossing your threshold sees themselves, they're, they're shocked and horrified by it, and they'll be repelled by their own sight. So mirror, like it also in the... Um, You'll, you'll see those African fetish figures, and they'll have often a, uh, a mirror on, on right at their center, which reflects the, the evil back on itself. This is, um, this is Mr. Jack Owens and Bud Spires down in Bentonia, Mississippi, playing on the front porch with uh, Jack's black cat giving me an assessing look. Um, this, I can't say that this directly relates to hoodoo, but this photo is really kind of the essence of what, I'm, what I try to do with my work, which is to, which is to find a, a documentary moment that speaks to what the music sounds like. So if you know the music of Jack Owens or Skip James or uh, the, the only one left now that does that kind of Bentonian style is Jimmy Duck Holmes. It's minor keyed, it's supernatural themes, um, it's suffused with um, the, the, the supernatural. And you know they would uh, one of the most famous songs they would that, that from that tradition is called "Devil Got My Woman." You know, I'd rather be the devil than to be that woman's man. It must have been the devil that changed that woman's mind. You know, it's it's all about sexual and spiritual warfare on a grand scale. Um, and so this picture of the cat seemed to kind of, and you know, encompass that whole that whole thing. Let's see. This, now this is something that I really want to talk about uh, as far as um, my relationship to the state of Mississippi. This was kind of a breakthrough moment for me because when I started coming down here, I would have my list 
of like, okay, I've got to get this done and this done. I've got to see this person. I've got to go to this festival. And what I would find is that my best laid plans often didn't yield the best pictures. But if I just use my instincts and I would say like, I feel like I need to go down this road. I feel like I need to stop and talk to this person. Um, it, if you, if I, when I started putting my faith in, in uh, well, in faith and serendipity, that's when the good stuff happened. So this one particular day, I was driving back home, headed toward Memphis, and I was on Old 61, and there was a thunderstorm on the horizon, and it was lightning flashing, and it hadn't wasn't raining yet, and it was like, oh my gosh. I need to get something in the foreground that I can have, try to catch the lightning in the background. And I was looking for anything, an old barn, an old house. And then I was, and I was going through Lake Carmen, Mississippi, where uh, not far from where um, uh, Sun, Sun uh, House made his 1941's recording for the Library of Congress. And I saw this fellow named W.C. Miles. He worked at this farm, that's cotton back there, but he had a little truck patch right beside the little place where he lived. And I stopped and I went tearing out and I said uh, you know hey I hate to bother you but there's this amazing electrical storm back there I was trying to get somebody's photo with it do you mind just standing there for just a second let's see if I can get the lightning behind you he's like he's just laughing he's like okay man whatever and he stood on his hoe and he, and he just rested for a minute and I shot about a 12 frames and I got lightning in two of them because just trying to catch it you know uh, and by that time all of a sudden, the storm is on us, buckets of water. He goes running to the house. I go running to the car, and I say, hey, thanks, I'll bring you a photo. Well, I go back a few months later. You know, I've got the film developed. I get a print. I get this beautiful, gorgeous print of him. And, I, and the next time I go down there, I drive by the house. Well, he's not home. So I'm like, oh, I don't want to leave it here. I really want to give it to him because I'm really proud of this picture. So then I wait, and a few months later, I go back down there, I catch him. Uh, and he's not there. In fact, I think the next time I went, there was nobody in the house. They had already moved out. And, and then I went on home. Well, then I'm, about a, more than a year passes, and it's really bothering me. I'm like, I've got to find this guy. So then I just go and I start showing the picture and asking around, and they tell me where he's living now. And I go down there, uh, and I found him, and, and it was so good to see him. By this time, it's like a year and a half since I made the picture. And I give him this big framed copy. And he was like, wow, this is amazing. This reminds me of like, you know, where I was living before and it was kind of tough times and I'm in a better place. I'm in a brick house now and he's, you know, his job situation was a little better and he thanked me and I just, thank goodness I asked him, I said, hey man, do you, you don't play music, do you? He said, oh, no, 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 I don't play music, but my daddy used to. I'm like, oh, your daddy, when did he pass? It's like, oh, he's not dead. He just lived down the road like Carmen. I'm like, can I go see him? And he's like, well, I tell you what, next time you come down, you call me, and we'll go on a Sunday, we'll go over there and visit Daddy. So we did. So now a few more months go by, and I go there, and we meet his father. His name is Mr. Willie Coffey. And he's sitting on his porch, and I ask him, I said, well, Mr. Coffey, uh, WC here tells me you used to, used to play uh, some blues. He said, uh, yep, I played a box back in the day. I quit in 1948, last time I played in a juke. I said, well, really? I said, who'd you play with around here? He said, well... I was a partner behind a guy named Charlie Sankster, um, uh, Will, Will Lovinghart, and these, are all, these other guys. He says, but I used to see guys like uh, Charlie Patton and Son House and Willie Brown. And he said, but my main man, the one that I grew up with and learned everything from, was a fellow named Robert Johnson. You ever heard of him? And I'm like, um, yeah, yes, Mr. Coffey, I, I've heard of Robert Johnson. And, and he had no idea about all the hoopla about Robert Johnson. So I went and subsequently visited him many, many times over the years, and I got recordings of him, and he told me some amazing stories about, about Robert Johnson. See, Robert was about three or four years older than him, so he really looked up and emulated him, and, har and he says that Robert used to get his little harmonica, and they would go, uh, but before he was playing guitar, they were in school together, one-room schoolhouse, and he said that they would get up underneath the schoolhouse during the recess where it's cool and dusty. And you could get up there, and because it was also a church, you could stand up where the pulpit was on the backside because it's raised up on those little pylons like they have in the Delta. And he said he'd be up in there playing his harp underneath the pulpit, and then school would be back, and the teacher wouldn't see him, and they'd hear a harmonica coming from under the floorboards, and they'd get in trouble, and they'd have to get back in... So he told me all these amazing stories about Robert Johnson. Um, and 
Mr. Willie passed, I don't know, um, back in the early, early to mid 2000s. Um, and I'm hoping I can transcribe some of those, all those uh, stories of his and do a, an article on him soon. Um, and and this, this one is a, is a similar story um, that even is uh, really kind of more impactful. When I started doing this in the early 90s, I, I, I would talk to Jim O'Neill, the editor of the start, started Living Blues magazine, Brewster Records. And he would give, he had helped me out. He would say, okay, have you seen this person yet? He said, okay, I go and see this person. And then he'd give me a name and I'd go visit them and I could build and try to find new people. There was this one guy, he says, that there's a guy in Coffeeville I haven't checked out yet. I heard he plays on his porch on Sundays. He said, I don't know his name. And so I let a long time go by. I mean, years and years. And I remember that, that he told me that uh, this had been about five years since I'd heard this, four years. So I was up in Oxford one Sunday, and I said, you know what? I don't have anything to do. I'm going to drive down to Coffeeville. I'm going to see if I can find this guy. So I go down there, and I ask, I said, is there anybody that plays music around here, like on Sundays? And at the gas station, they said, oh, you must be old Charles Caldwell, Cadillac Caldwell. Yeah, he lives out such and such road and told me how to get there. So I go out there, and sure enough, I mean, he had a whole yard full of Cadillacs and he played an old Gibson guitar, and he says that, um, you know, he was, a, he was a tall, he was almost seven foot tall with his hat, cowboy hat on, probably weighed every bit of 150 pounds. I mean, really skinny, tall, amazing figure. One of the, just the most direct and kindest and amazing self-aware human beings I've ever known in my life. And never had recorded, um, didn't really play out much. He was gonna do it after he retired. So I set up and I made some photos. I did this one photo of him reflected in the Cadillac, uh, one of his Cadillacs of him playing the guitar. And then right after that, Oxford American Magazine had hired me to do some stories for, I mean, some photographs for a story they were doing. And I submitted this as just a kind of a, a wild card freelance photo to go with it. And they ran it full page. So this was in 2000, year 2000. And I just, well, this is about a four second exposure with a, on a tripod with a long depth of field so I could get it all in focus. But that's how reflective that chrome was. Well, anyway, they ran it full page in the paper, and Bruce Watson over at Fat Possum Records in Oxford saw it and was like, wait a minute. It's our business to know who all the blues men are in Mississippi. I never heard of this guy. So they went down and checked him out. Turned out he was incredible. I mean, had this just really mature, forceful, you know, aggressive style and this incredible like tremolo singing. He had just this real muscularity to his blues, a uh, really unique kind of angular sound. It was, it was really amazing. Um, I visited him several times and I made some little field recordings and took a lot of pictures. Well, they decided that this was going to have to be their new artist. So they, uh, they put him, you know, they recorded him. Um, he was going to retire from his, the, his factory job. Uh, unfortunately, um, by the time they were finishing the recording, he found he out, I think it was pancreatic cancer. He had a very aggressive form of cancer. And uh, Mr. Caldwell actually wound up, he died before his first record came out. Um, but of coincidences that led me that day to go see him to take that picture that they happened, the editor picked it in the magazine. It got to Bruce. Bruce went down there, followed up. All of these things happened really kind of just in time to, to have a recorded legacy of, of, of Charles Caldwell. Um, and, you know, that's what I'm talking about with the faith and serendipity that comes with traveling in Mississippi. I mean, it is one of the most amazing places in the world is what keeps bringing me here. So how are we doing? Um, this is, as some of y'all know, Mr. Otha Turner. I'm gonna uh, show some, uh, some more pictures and, and play a little bit of his music here. He is, was, was the last of the old school fife players. Now the fife and drum, African American, North Mississippi fife and drum music is some of the oldest connections we have to Africa. Um, the music still exists in like the West Indies. But what happened was, is when they brought uh, folks over from Africa, they brought a lot of the drum tradition, even the homemade cane fife tradition. But um, since drums were a lot of time in the slavery days, 
were illegal because it was the idea of the talking drum, communication. You know, there was slave rebellions that were communicated plantation to plantation through drumming. Um, the white uh, slave plantation owners were terrified of, you know, that's why they killed off their language, their religion, everything as a means of, of control through, through destroying their culture. But the thing about culture is, is that it doesn't get destroyed. It goes underground. It hides in plain sight. So the fife and drum tradition got mixed with the Scots-Irish fife and drum tradition. So some of the early um, music, uh, the fife and drum corps, in both in the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, were actually African-American fife and drum. Now it died off everywhere except in North Mississippi, um, where it, it, has a, it is a kind of a strict time, like the, like the Scots-Irish you know, military fife and drum, um, but it has its own sort of African sensibility of, of improvisation. This is Charday Thomas, who some of you all have seen. She is the one that is now carrying on the fife and drum tradition from Otha Turner. This is her very first public performance when at five years old, and she just turned 30, I think, or 31. Uh, so this is the moment that she plays in public for the first time, and Otha was extremely proud. And you just had a sense that, that she had this power of the ancients in her, this powerful woman, even at that young age. Um, this is the photo, the first picnic after Otha Turner died in 2003. So this would have been around 2003. That's Charday and her brother Bill. And they were, this was a really intense emotional moment where they really were feeling the presence of the grandfather of Otha Turner who had passed, but they were really uh, evoking that. And this was an amazing picnic. So with that in mind, um, I'm gonna see if I can make this work. Um, gonna, gonna play a little slideshow here with some music. All right, let me see, full screen. See if we can get the music this. So this is all the pictures I've made over the years of uh, at Otha's picnics. That's him making the cane fives. It's Napoleon Strickland. Abe Young.
That's Otha's funeral. Pretty powerful stuff there. Uh, if you, if, how many of y'all have seen the movie uh, Gangs of New York? I don't know if you, yeah. Well, the scene where when the dead rabbits are marching to battle early on against uh, the nativists, and you hear this incredible like driving fife and drum music, that was Otha Turner. Um, it, that was actually Otha Turner's band from Mississippi that was used to, you know. What I love about that is that it represented this sort of like you know, these, these Irish immigrants battling the nativists. Um, it, it, you know, it, as the quintessential Irish battle music. But it was Afri actually African Americans from North Mississippi that were providing the actual music that really symbolized the power of that battle. Um, so, that, yeah, there were so many things I wanted to say in the middle of that. Um, kind of coming up toward the end, I just want to show some of the... Uh, Set up for what I'm going to do at the end here. This is uh, some uh, juke joint images. This is Miss Deborah Hooks um, boogieing down at the uh, Thompson Grocery in Bobo, Mississippi. This was a, an amazing rural little, sometimes juke joint and uh, in general store. That's Sam Carr in the background there. You can't see David Porter on the base, and that's Terry Big T Williams over there on the right. Um, and it was so close to the bathroom that if you went to the bathroom, Terry had to raise his guitar up so you could open the door to go into the little bathroom there. And what you can't see is behind me, there's a whole row of toilet tissue and Brillo pads and soup and soap and all that kind of stuff. But this really is a quintessentially what the Mississippi Blues is really about. I mean, this is not about the club. It's not about the performance. It's, not, it's community music for local people, for social dancing for community cohesion, for release. It is, it is a social music, it is a dance music. Um, and this is you know, one of the last places here was, you know, where that still happened. And it wasn't in like a, a club, I and mean, it was often in a sharecropper shack where they would, a dedicated juke joint, they'd have a, 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 a um, they would have a kitchen with a board over it, they'd sell fish sandwiches, gambling in the back, music in the front, corn whiskey dancing um, and it would like start at Friday, go all through the weekend up until like almost dawn on Monday, then everybody would go to the fields. Uh, well, I'm about, to, I'm about to get to Poe Monkeys in just a second. I'm going to show some pictures. You're a perfect segue, Rick. But, um, right, exactly. Well, and this, to me, the greatest juke joint of all time, and I'm talking about in all of history, was Junior Cambro's place. And it was on Highway 4 between Senatobia and Holly Springs out in Chulahoma. And on Sunday nights, this place, this Shark Cathedral of the Blues, it was a folk art emporium. It used to be an old store and a church and probably a barn at one point. It was filled with all this amazing folk art and stuff. And... If you know anything about the North Mississippi Hill Country music, it is just like it's derived from the fife and drum. It's often one chord or just a couple of chords. This driving, modal, trance-like music where you can just completely lose yourself, you know, in evoking the spirits and feeling the heat 
and dance all night long, sometimes on just one chord. Um, this was just a particularly transcendent night in the late 90s uh, where these, these folks were out there dancing while Junior Kimbrough and R.L. Burnside were playing. Um, a similar thing, it's always something about Mississippi. It's Sunday night is the big night for Duke, and I guess it's the last moment before you got to go work for the man on Monday. This is little Bill Wallace playing at a place called uh, Boss Hall in, um, in Leland, Mississippi. Just, you know, and that, this has been used on like album covers and various things in the past. Um, this is the last of the four photos that I have in the Southbound exhibit. Um, I had the Silver Dimes, I had Chardet and, and Bill uh, playing, I had Charles Cadillac Caldwell in the reflection, and this is the fourth one that's in this exhibit. This is uh, Willie King playing at another amazing place called Betty's Place in, uh, on the Alabama. Mississippi line up in the prairie. It's in a, a place called Prairie Point, Mississippi. It's no longer there. Willie's no longer with us, unfortunately. But I chased down Willie King for years trying to find him. He was a hard man to find. He stayed in Missoulaville at this place, and I'd go there and leave a message, and finally he called me. After about five years of tracking him down, I found out he's going to be playing at Betty's place. I was an, almost an hour late because it was impossible to find in the middle of nowhere at night. I walk in, Willie's there, I wave to him, I say, he's like, he was expecting me, talk to Betty, say, hey, I'm here with Willie, I need to make some pictures, if it's okay, she's like, do what you want to. I set up a light, I set my, my thing down, and almost immediately, this scene happens. And, and I got this photo of Willie doing his thing, and this incredible uh, scene going on. And, uh, and that wound up being on the cover of his second album, called Living in a New World. Another thing I'll say about this, if you see the background band, just to Willie's right, the guy in the white shirt looking away, that's Willie Lee Halper and Thomas Hodges on the, I think on the guitar, on the bass. They are playing, they, that band still continues, even though Willie's not here. They're playing at Duck Hill tomorrow. Uh, the Duck Hill Blues Festival starts at 5 o'clock tomorrow in Duck Hill, Mississippi. And these guys are playing, I think, third, so about 7 o'clock tomorrow. Um, and um, I got to throw this in. That's BB King playing at uh, at Club Ebony. Um, and as mentioned, Po Monkeys. Now Po Monkeys um, is or was uh, the last real authentic rural juke joint. Um, unfortunately, they didn't have a tradition of live music. Uh, this is an amber type that I made of of. Um, of Po Monkeys, but it, uh, the main thing happened on, on Thursday nights only. They had a DJ in there, and this was this is the closest thing to a real juke joint you would have ever found. He he was a tractor driver, worked for the local farmer, cotton growing all the way around, dirt yard, uh, road in the front, bayou across the way with horrible mosquitoes. On Thursday nights, it was this amazing transformed place where people would come in and dance, and they had some early on they sold pork chop sandwiches and beer and. Uh, you played pool, um, mixture of all kinds of folks from all over the world, and it was just, and Monkey would come out, his name was Willie Seabury, but they called him the Poe Monkey, and he would, he was like the Wayne Newton of the Delta, man, he would come out in a white suit, and, and tell you, make sure everybody's having a good time, and next thing you know, he'd have a red suit on, and then he'd have on like some sparkly thing, and he'd do like costume change, like all night long like a Vegas floor show. But it was all, and it was just, it would almost bring tears to your eyes just because he has had such a love for the people. He had such a love for making people happy. And like for instance, if, if the music was bumping and everybody's sitting around and there's no life in the place, he'd get up on the chair and just start humping and just doing some crazy stuff or do just to, and everybody would just laugh and just like, what the hell? Monkey, you just, you crazy. And then they'd get up and dance. Because it's like he'd break the ice. He was just this ambassador of fun. Just this amazing. Well, that, that was a Monday night. That wasn't advertised. Yeah, that was, that was a different kind of party. Yeah. That was, a different, that was a different kind of party on a Monday night. The public was invited in on Thursday nights. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a whole different thing. Um, all right, I'm going to close, close out. I'm going to do a little song here. Um, this is... All right. So, sweetie, can you help me out on this? Um, just when I get ready, hit the, hit the play button. 
So this is a collection of... Um, all righty. Oh, all righty. I'm about to play my song, Rick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So um, what I decided to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a song instead of just doing a recording music. I'm going to do an old Robert Johnson song from 1936 and then show my little uh, images of some of my favorite juke joint pick. So uh, this is kind of what hardcore Mississippi juke music would have sounded like in the pre-war era back in the 1930s. Go ahead. And you'll see uh, some all of the different juke joints from, uh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Let's see here. Oh, good, good, good. This is the last little bit. All right. Um, I'm just going to do one last thing. Have we got time for it? How are we doing? Yeah, just um, one last song. We'll take it down a little bit, do an old song, and then just the, the last collection is just, there's so many thousands of images that I've got. You just I don't really have time for them all. So um, we're just going to run just a whole... Um, just a whole collection of just kind of random, random images. And I'm going to play an old song um, called Trouble in Mind. It's one of the oldest, uh, oldest songs in the blues and jazz tradition. I'm going to play um, a combination of a Blind Connie Williams and a Big Bill Brunson.
Thank you all very much.